In April of 1999, one of Canada's leading dental researchers began calling for an end to water fluoridation. That researcher was Dr. Hardy Lineback, president of the Canadian Association of Dental Research and head of preventive dentistry at the University of Toronto. And I guess I'm here in Mississauga because here we have in yourself a practicing dentist an expert advisor to the Canadian Dental Association and president of the Canadian Association for Dental Research and the chairman, head of the Department of Preventive Dentistry at Toronto. But about a year ago, the name made headlines in Canada and beyond when you came out and said you were opposed to fluoridation. Mm. What led up to that? Uh, basically, uh, it started in 1992 when, when I helped a colleague of mine, uh, Chris Clark, who's a public health dentist at University of British Columbia. Together we organized a workshop uh, to look at the issue of whether or not fluoride supplements should be banned for children who are susceptible for What's dental fluoride? fluorosis. Fluoride supplement is, is a tablet of fluoride that gives you the equivalent of a daily dose of fluoridated water. Uh, it's, it's a dose that, that we had always assumed was necessary to protect kids in non-fluoridated areas. So this would be a tablet that they would swallow? Yes, or chew and swallow. Chew and swallow, mm -hmm. yeah. And what was your conclusion about the benefit of those supplements? At the end of the conference, we had experts from all over the states and Canada come together. We, we came up with a new schedule saying basically, let's ban fluoride supplements for kids under the age of three because it was causing dental fluorosis and it wasn't providing that much of a benefit at all. Okay. Now, what was it then that took you from opposing supplements before the age of three to opposing having fluoride in the drinking water? A number of events occurred. Um, first, I was asked to reorganize another convention or conference on fluoride supplements because the organizations couldn't agree. Uh, so we convened again after five years in 1997. I invited a number of experts from all over the world and we had a, a new conference on fluoride supplements and during that time I reviewed the literature as well and discovered that there really wasn't any evidence um, that uh, fluoride swallowing does any good. Well, tell us more about industrial grade uh, fluoride being used for the water supply. Tell us more about that. Well, I had always assumed that the fluoride that we were using to, to fluoridate the water supply was pharmaceutical grade sodium fluoride. Then I found out that the majority of the fluoride that's used in fluoridating water supplies in Canada, I got a, a federal government document documenting it, uh, the majority of it is sodium uh, or hydrofluorosilicic acid uh, or sodium uh, silicates, uh, fluorosilicates and these are added to the water supply to um, produce one part per million fluoride in the water. They dilute this stuff down to one part per million. Apparently this dilutes all the contaminants that are in there down to levels that are allow allowed by the EPA. Um, George Glasser showed me a list of all the contaminants in, in one of the articles he wrote and I could not believe that we were actually dumping lead and arsenic and even radium which is produced in the process of making this, uh, this uh, pollutant. From what I understand the pollutant is recovered from the smokestack scrubbers in the pho phosphate fertilizer industry and it's, it's very rich in fluoride, very toxic uh, but of course when you dilute it into the water supply it goes down to one part per million and supposedly is quite safe. My concern is that we're building up the contaminants in our system. We know that lead accumulates in soft tissues, the brain and, and bone. We know that actually lead accumulating in teeth make the teeth more susceptible to dental decay. My concern is also the radium contaminants that are found in uh, hydrofluorosilicic acid. This is, this is known now from the phosphate fertilizer industry and when you make phosphate fertilizer you release some of the radium from the, uh, the earth and this now gets recovered in this industrial grade fluoride that they recover from the smokestacks. They're putting this stuff in our water. 
And then I found an article saying that radium is the source or one of the uh, main reasons why we have osteosarcoma in Canadian children, uh, an article written by Finkelstein uh, showing the connection between radium in the water and osteosarcoma in, ki in children. Uh, how many dentists in Canada do you think are aware that this material, this fluoride that is put into the drinking water actually is this industrial hazardous waste? Do you think most of them are aware or unaware? Most. If the only person teaching preventive dentistry didn't know about it, do you think anybody else would know? <laughs> no, I don't think even a single dentist knew until it started um, becoming more uh, of an open, open issue because of the anti-fluoridationists. Uh, when you talk to other dentists, and they hear about this being an industrial waste product. Does it phase them at all? Or what was the reaction? First, they, the first reaction is prove it. Yeah. <laughs> they, they don't believe it. They don't believe it. No. What is dental fluorosis and what causes it? Dental fluorosis is uh, simply the, um, the mal uh, malformation of dental enamel. And actually, dental fluorosis uh, has affected not only the enamel but also the dentin. The dentin is the inside layer uh, of the tooth. Uh, the, the, surf the surface layer is, is the enamel and that's what we see. We see white spots on kids teeth and th th that's what we call dental fluorosis. Uh, the way it forms basically is that the fluoride interferes with the um, development of the tooth. I did 10 years worth of research in my laboratory studying tooth development, so I know how teeth develop. And uh, Pam Den Beston and a few others have been looking at uh, the effects of fluoride on tooth development. And we now believe that there are several mechanisms involved. Uh, fluoride could be inhibiting the uh, enzymes, the serine proteinases that are degrading the final traces of proteins that are left behind in the teeth. Um, the proteins, if they're left behind on the surface of the enamel, will take up space and it won't allow the crystals to grow to this beautiful shiny uh, luster that you see uh, normal enamel presents itself. You, you see these white spots uh, or splotches or lines. Uh, in, in more severe fluorosis you actually see the surface layer flaking off. You see brown spots. Um, the classical Colorado brown stain. You, we're now seeing that uh, in uh, North America in fluorosis area in in areas of uh, um, fluoridated cities where kids are adding to the fluoride exposure with toothpaste, we're actually getting brown stain, the Colorado Colorado brown stain, in healthy kids. Now it may not be a big concern to them, but the current concern I have obviously is that they've got too much fluoride in their system anyway. Well, that's actually my next question because uh, certainly in America the various government agencies now dismiss uh, dental fluorosis as a cosmetic effect. That it's, uh, you know, polish it off or do something with it, and, and it's, it hasn't done any harm to the, the person. Could you address that question? Is it just a cosmetic effect? Should we be concerned about dental fluorosis for other reasons? Well, number one, uh, simply a cosmetic effect is, is a brush off. Uh, what, what basically they're saying is that uh, we're we're willing to accept a certain amount of cosmetic problems to prevent decay. Well, if the fluoridation isn't preventing decay anymore, and there's now plenty of evidence in the last five years that it's not preventing decay anymore, then the fluorosis that's being produced is now being treated for many different, uh, in many different ways. It's being treated by surface polishing, by bleaching, by porcelain veneers, if you actually estimate how much work is being done on kids with dental fluorosis, we're treating way more teeth for the problem of dental fluorosis than we would treat if there was a marginal increase in dental decay from taking fluoride out of the water. Most of the studies now show that the fluoridated cities have twice the, the, the uh, uh, incidence of dental fluorosis, and yet the decay rate is, is no different. Number two is that the fluoride is accumulating in these people. And I've got lots of evidence to show you that even if you stop the fluoride exposure at a very early age, the kids still get fluorosis in their back teeth because the bone is loaded with fluoride. 
their system develops or, or picks up so much fluoride from the overexposure from the water and the toothpaste and other sources from the diet that the bone has too much fluoride. The bone is the source of the fluoride that causes the dental fluorosis. Now, because they have so much fluoride in the bone, we have more concerns about tooth development, delayed tooth eruption, malocclusion, possible bone fracture, premature skeletal development or maturation. There are many concerns now that are appearing from research uh, that fluoride in kids in their bone system is not good. Add to that the risk for osteosarcoma. Explain what osteosarcoma is. Bone cancer. Now, I have a serious concern about bone cancer. We're starting to see some publications now that links fluoridated cities with bone cancer. There may be a number of explanations for this. We now know that fluoride reduces testosterone. There may be a connection be between this lowering of testosterone and uh, osteosarcoma in young males. Um, I have a concern because nobody has yet measured the amount of fluoride that the bone cells are exposed to when they're turning bone over. If kids have higher fluoride levels in their bone and their bone cells are exposed to those higher fluoride levels, we know from in vitro studies, studies in test tubes and in, in culture, that fluoride at higher concentrations are cytotoxic, that they cause damage, they can cause cancer, they can cause, they, these higher levels can cause all kinds of damage to the, to the cell. So these bone cells are being exposed to, likely, higher levels than normal and nobody has yet measured right locally, uh, right next to the cell, how much fluoride uh, these cells are being exposed. And dental decay, I was concerned that people were accumulating fluoride in bone, in kids and, and, and uh, elderly uh, patients. Uh, at the time that, that all of these epidemiological studies were being published, where there's an increased risk for hip fractures, um, you know, Danielson studies, Jacobs studies, uh, these, these were studies that were starting to raise some concern in the uh, you know medical community that perhaps fluoride could be causing some harm some increased risk for bone fracture so we set out to actually prove that one part per million wasn't really that detrimental that it wasn't affecting the bones the way that some of these studies were suggesting and that's how we actually got fun